Have you ever wondered how a single cell comes into life? A new cell can only be made by the duplication of an existing one. To obtain a fully functional copy, a specific sequence of events must take place, the so-called cell cycle. This cycle of duplication and division is the essential mechanism by which all living things reproduce, and thus controlled by numerous regulatory mechanisms to ensure its correct execution. One major requirement of the cell cycle is the duplication and subsequent segregation of the genetic material. The chromosome duplication occurs during S phase, and its segregation as well as the cell division occur in M phase. Later is further divided into the nuclear division, referred to as mitosis, and the cytoplasmic division, also known as cytokinesis. Apart from the duplication of the genome, most cells also duplicate their organelles and macromolecules. To allow the necessary time to grow, as well as to ensure that the conditions are right, most cells have gap phases, namely G1 and G2. G1, S and G2 together are also known as interphase. If the conditions are right, newly divided cells can divide themselves again in the same way and again and again and again, continuing the course of life. As long as they don't decide to withdraw from the cycle to a specialized non-dividing state called G0, or they trigger apoptosis or die from necrosis. The ratio and duration of the individual phases vary between different organisms and tissue. Further on we will therefore focus on a typical human cell representing mammalian cells. But due to the fundamental importance of the cell cycle, its basic organization and regulations are similar in all eukaryotes. As mentioned earlier, the correct execution of the cell cycle is vital for the cell and thus a complex regulation system is necessary. This cell cycle control system triggers the major events of the cell cycle and is based on a connected series of biochemical switches. These switches are generally binary, so either on or off, and are irreversible. Furthermore, backup mechanisms ensure a robust and reliable system that can operate under a variety of conditions and component failures. Finally, it is highly adaptable to suit specific cell types and to respond to various intra- and extracellular signals. The control system governs cell cycle progression at three major regulatory transitions. The start or restriction point in late G1, where the cell commits to cell cycle entry and chromosome duplication. Then the G2M transition, where the early mitotic events get triggered and the metaphase to anaphase transition to complete mitosis and cytokinesis. If a problem inside or outside the cell is detected, the control system normally blocks the progression. Each of these transitions depend on the activation of cycling-dependent kinases that, as the name implies, are regulated by the presence of cyclins. Each CDK binds a specific cycling whose concentration oscillates during the cell cycle and thus controls the progression. Furthermore, to fully activate the CDK, the CDK activation kinase must phosphorylate it to cause a conformational change that exposes the active site. And now the fun begins. As each progression should only be triggered when the individual conditions are fulfilled, a network of biochemical switches has been established. The major cell cycle regulatory proteins include kinases and phosphatases that modify CDKs, CDK inhibitory proteins that bind to the cycling CDK complexes to block the active site, and ubiquitin ligases that trigger proteolysis. Furthermore, transcription regulation provides an important additional level of regulation. During the S phase, it is essential that the genome is copied only once. This is achieved by the activation of the SCDK that further activates DNA helicases and recruits the DNA synthesis machinery. At the same time, several mechanisms prevent this assembly a second time until the end of mitosis, where it gets prepared for a new cycle. SCDK also promotes centrosome duplication, which will be important for the correct establishment of the mitotic spindle during mitosis. The mitotic spindle is a bipolar array of microtubules, consisting of three major types of microtubules, namely astral, kinetochore, and interpolar microtubules, and its main function is the segregation of the two sets of chromosomes. For this, they use dynanes and kinesins, motor proteins that can move along the microtubules. Before we talk about the regulatory mechanisms during the M phase, let's have a brief recap about the different stages. Mitosis gets separated into five principal stages, beginning with the prophase, in which the replicated chromosomes condense and the mitotic spindle assembles between the two centrosomes. In the following pro-metaphase, the nuclear envelope breaks down and chromosomes attach to the spindle and start the active movement. In the metaphase, the chromosomes are finally aligned at the equator of the spindle and the kinetochores are attached to all sister chromatids. At anaphase, sister chromatid separates and spindle centrosomes move further apart. During telophase, daughter chromosomes arrive at each spindle pole and decondense while the nuclear envelope assembles around them, completing the formation of two nuclei and marking the end of mitosis. During the telophase, the cytoplasm already begins with the contraction of the contractual ring. 
During cytokinesis, the cytoplasm is divided into two by the contractile ring and the daughter cells emerge. The entry into mitosis is dependent on active MCDK. It induces several events by phosphorylation of key proteins, most notably the chromosome condensation by phosphorylating subunits of condensin, the assembly of the mitotic spindle by phosphorylating microtubule associated proteins and motor proteins, and the breakdown of the nuclear envelope by phosphorylating inner nuclear envelope proteins and lamina components. The switch from metaphase to anaphase is primarily triggered by the ubiquitin ligase APCC, the anaphase promoting complex. The APCC further promotes the events that complete mitosis, including the disassembly of the spindle and the reformation of the nuclear envelope through the activation of downstream targets. The final step of the cell cycle is division of cytoplasm, which occurs in late anaphase and is completed by the end of telophase. This step is present in most of the cells, but there are some that undergo mitosis without cytokinesis. The first sign of cytokinesis is formation of a cleavage furrow, a structure composed of actin and myosin filaments. It deepens and spreads around the cell until the ends meet in the middle and form a contractile ring. The formation of the ring at the right place and time is of crucial importance and the central role in this process is played by a mitotic spindle. By the end of contraction process, two cells are held together via a structure called midbody, which represents the remainings of central spindle. When contraction is completed, membrane insertion and fusion seal the gap between the other cells. A key event that also takes place in late M phase is inactivation of cyclins, dependent on APCC activity, which promotes their degradation. Complex is also active even after mitosis has finished, ensuring the cell has time to grow and respond to stimuli telling her whether to enter another round of division or not. Regulation of cell cycle, and in contrast cell death, determines cell number and their size. This regulation occurs as a response to intra- and extracellular signals. These signals are proteins that bind to specific receptors and through signal transduction initiate changes in the cell that result in cell division, growth, survival, or death. There are three major classes of these proteins. Mitogens, which overcome the breaking mechanisms caused by APCC by stimulating expression of G1 cyclins, which are resistant to APCC complex and thus promote entry into cell division. Growth factors that promote growth by stimulating accumulation of proteins and other macromolecules increase nutrient uptake and production of ATP. And survival factors that promote cell survival by suppressing apoptosis. Progression is also controlled by intracellular signals. For example, DNA damage can suppress further progression through cell cycle by activating specific proteins which lead to elevated levels of cyclin kinase inhibitors. One of these substrates is well known P53, whose mutations are associated with many types of cancer. Previously discussed regulation of cell number takes into account the cell death. Cells die when they are not needed or when they become damaged or infected. These processes are not random, but mainly occur as a response to intra- or extracellular signals and include sequence of events that lead to apoptosis. Morphologically, cells shrink and condense, their cytoskeleton collapses and chromatin is broken into fragments. Surface of the cell forms bulges that separate from the rest and form apoptotic bodies, parts of the cell enclosed in membrane that are phagocytosed quickly so they prevent inflammation. The executors of apoptosis are special proteins called caspases, which belong to the class of proteases. There are two major classes, initiator caspases, which are activated in response to stimuli and begin apoptotic process by activating executioner caspases, and executioner caspases, which catalyze protein cleavage events that led to previously described morphological changes. Their targets are, for example, nuclear lamina proteins or components of cytoskeleton. Because it is destructive and irreversible, apoptosis needs to be regulated carefully. Signals for inducing apoptosis can come from the cell environment or from the inside as a result of cell damage. Therefore, there are two main pathways that can activate apoptosis, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic pathways begin with extracellular signal binding to the receptor. Receptor has specific domains, called dead domains, that bind adapter proteins which bind initiator caspases, forming a death-inducing signaling complex. Initiator caspases are activated in this complex and proceed to activate executioner caspases. Intrinsic or mitochondrial pathway begins with intracellular signals, such as DNA damage. These signals activate specific proteins which belong to the class of BCL2 proteins. They can roughly be divided into pro- and anti-apoptotic. 
proteins activated by signals act pro-apoptotic by inactivating anti-apoptotic members of the family. This in turn allows other pro-apoptotic proteins to form channels in mitochondrial membranes which lead to accumulation of cytochrome C in the cytoplasm. Cytochrome C binds to adapter protein and forms a structure known as apoptosome. This structure recruits initiator space and activates it, which in turn leads to a specific sequence of events mentioned before. The constant balance between pro- and anti-apoptotic BCL2 proteins ensure that apoptosis is triggered only when and where it is needed. This balance can be achieved through synthesis of proteins called inhibitors of apoptosis. Other mechanisms include transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation of BCL2 proteins activity. This presentation summarizes cell cycle and cell death. Thank you for listening.